All right, and we're on unit four, lesson five, the last lesson. So interpret multi-bar and line graphs. So it's gonna look similar to some of the things we've done here recently with you know visualized uh, uh, data. And so by the time you complete this lesson, you will be able to um, identify multi-bar and line graphs, compare varied data, and interpret information presented on a multi-bar line graph. So we'll see what those look like here in a second. And our little bit of audio. When studying economics, you will often encounter data presented in multi-bar and line graphs. Like single bar and line graphs, these visuals can be used to compare hair values and to show changes over time. However, because they use more than one bar or line, they also allow for the comparison of varied but connected data over time. As with other areas of the GED test, learning to interpret multi-bar and line graphs will test your ability to interpret information at various depth of knowledge levels through the use of complex reading skills and thinking skills. Yeah, so it's just kind of continuing the idea of interpreting multiple pieces of data. And in this case, they're all going to appear sort of on the same graph. Uh, so and we'll see what that looks like here. It'll make a lot of sense once we see it. So here, right, we have average annual mortgage and prime interest rate. So green is the average annual mortgage rate. And that uh, yellow color is, I'm sorry, the average, yeah, the green is the average annual and the yellow is the average annual prime. Uh, the difference there, a prime interest rate is basically what the uh, the rate is for someone with good credit. Uh, and, the, you know, I think right now they're somewhere around 3.25%. Uh, percent. So if you got like a mortgage rate and you had that, you know, upper credit score in the 700s or something like that, you would probably qualify for an average uh, or a prime interest rate around, you know, 3.25, 3.5, something like that. Um, whereas the average was what just generally, right, everybody was, uh, you know, paying on their mortgage. That was the rate. So the Y axis going up the side here is percentage rate from zero to 14%. If you got a 14% mortgage rate, I feel sorry for you. Um, and uh, across the bottom here on the X axis are the years. So might see some familiar years here, right? 2002, 2004, 2006, 2008. That's a lot, you know, we've been working in this time frame here lately in economics. And what we see, right, is in green, the average annual mortgage rate was lower uh, percentage wise than the prime rates. Uh, through 2002, 2004, and then 2006, we see that reverse, right? So the average annual rate was higher than a prime interest rate. And remember, we talked a lot about that um, housing bubble, right? And that market and those subprime mortgages. So around that time is when we actually saw an increase in that average annual rate because a lot of that would have been the subprime mortgages, right? So you got the prime mortgage interest rate and you have your subprime getting higher. And then 2008, it bounces back out because a lot of those uh, uh, subprime loans, uh, people had defaulted on them. So it had kind of balanced back out where the average annual rate had fallen again. And on our text box, when it, it's pointing to our, our multiple bar graphs there, it says by studying the bars of a double bar graph, you could compare two quantities at a given time, right? That's the idea as well. And it might be more, it could be, you know, maybe three or four, uh, as well as the ways in which these quantities change over time. So that's the idea. We get two values that we're looking at, two similar ideas and how they're changing over time. Uh, and then uh, the next box says the key of a double bar graph will typically use color or shading to identify what each bar represents. In this graph, one bar represents the average annual mortgage rate, while the other represents the average prime rate, which we talked about. Uh, and, you know, that's, you know, fortunately here, we only have the two bars. We've, we've noticed sometimes with the graphs, they get into some sort of colors that are hard to discern from one another. Hopefully we're not going to run into that today with that much information. So, yeah, real simple. We're just multi 
bars, and we're probably going to see some multi-line graphs as well as we go along here. All right. And I should also mention with prime with those interest rates, the 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 the, the Federal Reserve actually um, has a big part in that as well. They set interest rates. Okay, and making assumptions. So you can typically assume that an author includes information in a multi-bar or line graph to convey a relationship, uh, such as compare, contrast, or cause effect between or among the data. Right. So these are very, you know, these two are the two ideas of, of mortgage rates. Uh, you know, your prime interest rate and a mortgage rate. Those are those are those are linked. Uh, you wouldn't have a graph necessarily with mortgage rates and the price of corn, right? Something like that. Um, so they're going to be related. And question one, uh, Christiana, would you mind reading question one for us? Um, question one. Based on the double bar graph above, which of the following statement is true? A, in 2002, the average mortgage rate was higher than the average prime interest rate. B, the average prime interest rate is in 20, 2008 was about 6%. Um, see, the average mortgage rate in 2006 was about 10%. Um, the, the average mortgage rate dropped by 2% between 2004 and 2006. <laughs> um, B? Yeah, we looked there. The average prime interest rate in 2008, right, was uh, about 6%, right? If we had a ruler. Mm -hmm. That going across there, we could see it's it's right around six percent there. So yeah. that's a straightforward answer. Um, yeah. So number ah. one is B. Is boy. Um, let's see. Let's go, Tracy. Would you mind reading question two or the the our passage there for number two? Yes. Uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, he fed, as it is popularly known, is the central bank above, above the United States government and the national banking system. The Fed regulated banks in addition, addition to issuing currencies and carrying out monetary, monetary policy for the nation. One of the first most notable functions is its control of the nation money supply. Uh, to increase the nation money supply, the Fed can buy U.S. treasury securities from the bank and the American public's interest in new cash into the economy. It also can increase the money supply by lowering the interest rate at which it lends to commercial banks. This, encourage, this encourages banks to borrow more money from the Fed, uh, thereby raising the money supply. In the United States, money supply is ev evaluated in different calories are measured. Items are flayed into these categories according to their liquidity or how easy how easy or how easily they can be turned into cash. The first category M1 it includes the coins and paper money held by the public and checking deposits at public banks. The second category, M2, included all of M1 plus saving deposits in trust earning deposits less than $100,000 and money market deposits and mutual funds. About the, the graph? Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, I just want to mention when they say something like securities, that's things like a savings bond, like U.S. bonds that you can purchase. And they're very secure. Um, you know, they're they're, uh, a, you know, real simple kind of investment that you can buy um, and, you know, with guaranteed interest rates and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, the graph there. So our dollars and billions on the on the Y axis. And then by year, well, by decade, right, from 1970 to 2010, and there's that M1 and M2. So the first category, right, it said M1 includes the coins and paper money. So that paper currency uh, held by the public and checking deposits at public banks. And then M2, um, it says, you know, the second category, M2 includes all of M1 plus savings deposits, interest earning deposits, less than 100,000 and money market deposits and mutual funds. So looking at that, let's take a look here. I see that M2 typically, you know, in, in billions of dollars has, it sort of started to climb at a much, much higher rate, right, as we get into the 21st century. And then it really zoomed off between 2000 and 2010, where the M1, which was just the currency, continued kind of steady along that time. So let's look at our questions here and see what it says. Um, Grace, would you mind reading question two? All right. Which of the following statements will always be true? Uh, the value of M1 is 300 billion. B, the value of M2 is increasing steadily. C, the value of M2 is greater than that of MI, M1. And D, the value of M1 is approximately one half the value of M2. C. C. Yeah, we, you know, I don't want to get into the weeds with, you know, this, you know, the Fed and, you know, all, all that complicated stuff. But, you know, just the one thing to remember if M1 is just the currency, right? Just the paper money, and M2 is the paper money plus, you know, these deposits and other things then, you know, just critical thinking tells you that, well, M2 will always be greater than M1 because it's M1 plus another value, right? Um, so simply put then, so C, right, the value of M2 is greater than that of M1 and will likely always be, should be. All right, so two is C, more on the Fed. I like here on number three, up here it says he fed, and then it's corrected down here, so it actually says the fed for that <laughs> start. Yeah, that sometimes proofread people proofread. Okay, so three. Uh, let's go to Etta. Would you mind reading number three for us? Okay, it says which of the following was the approximate value of M one in two thousand ten? A, about 100 billion, B, about 200 billion, C, about 300 billion, or D, about 400 billion. It looks to me about B, 200 billion. There you go. And yeah, so you just got to, and also sometimes, you know, you just got to cut out that noise when it asks you about a particular line, right? So I'm just looking at M1. Where does M1, you know, intersect with 2010? Uh, and you're looking right about 200 billion. Right. And just always make sure that you, you know, understand the values, right? Whether it's the years on the bottom here and decades and the and the values up here. Now, they might, you know, try to trip you up and throw in like a, a million or something like that on the test. I don't know. Uh, but here we, we see the same values for every answer. So three as uh, B as in boy and four. Sasha Gay, would you mind reading number four? Based on the inform based on the information, which in which of the following years did the economy probably have the most liquidity? I'm thinking, well, A, 
1980, B, 1990, C, 2000, and D, 2010. I'm thinking D. So it's D, right? Yeah. Remember, we, we talked a little bit about liquidity is, is that available cash, right? Um, what you can turn into cash immediately. Uh, and just looking at that, right, that M1 amount is just our currency. So it's just the cash. Um, and that is higher than any other year. So there we know that it's just uh, what's going to be available. That's liquid money, right? That is a liquid investment, just the cash, and it's highest at 2010. So D as in dog for number four. I remember we talked about illiquid things, you know, like those investments in, in real estate or your, um, uh, you know, like the uh, hardware, if you, if, if you have like some type of construction business, you know, like your tools and things, things that are harder to get the value out of if you need to sell them and may take longer. And our last question here, we've got a new little graph, uh, federal government age distribution of respondent workers. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by respondent, but what we have on the graph is uh, the tell. Okay. Okay. So we have teleworkers on the green and all federal employees in the yellow and the percentage that those work and then by age. And we see pretty steady whether they're 29 and under, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, or 60 and older, both of those are pretty steadily matched by, with the percentage, right? So our y-axis has the percentage there. Let's take a look here. Uh, Nilda, would you mind reading number five? Nilda? Well, I saw Nilda and she's gone. Okay. <laughs> I know I let her into the class and she's disappeared on us. Uh, Christiana, let's go back to you. How about number five there? Number five, which of the following is true about, sorry, which of the following is true of the federal labor force? A, the empl employee, over age 40 are less likely to telecommunicate, telecommute. Telecommute, than, like what we're yeah. doing now, right? <laughs> <laughs> telecommute yeah. than younger employees. B, age is not a factor in whether federal employees telecommute, telecommute. Commutes. <laughs> more and more employees under a 30 commute telecommute tele than employees over over age 40. The, the percentage of employees that telecommute commute decrease after age 40. Mm. And then B. Yeah, right. So we see that it, there's not much difference there, regardless of age. So that's what they're mm -hmm. talking about, teleworkers, right? So uh, people that are, you know, basically work from home, telecommute, right? You, uh, a commuter is somebody that travels to work. It means you you travel, you know, virtually. So just like we're doing, uh, working at home, things like that. And we see the percentages there. And, you know, honestly, it, Oddly enough, even, you know, your older kind of, you know, say a lot of times the older generation are not as tech savvy, but they're, you know, telecommuting just as much as, um, you know, all federal workers. So, yeah, that's all there is to it. You know, age is not a factor there. That's, it, you know, making an inference, not even an inference, really. That's a conclusion uh, that there's really age is not a factor when it comes to that. So B as in boy for five. And then real quickly here, just to review our five answers. One was B as in boy, 
two is C for cat. Three, B as in boy. Four, D as in dog. B. Okay, we'll move over here to the workbook. <clears throat> and again, it says multi bar and line graphs allow for comparisons of multiple sets of related data over a particular time period. By interpreting the bars and lines that appear on these graphs, you can compare these values of two types of data at the same point in time, right? Compare and contrast what we've been doing a lot here this uh, unit, well, as examine the patterns and trends that each set of data follows over time. When interpreting a multi-bar or line graph, first familiar, right, yep, familiarize yourself with the subject of the graph, right? Always talking about the title, as well as the labels for each axis. Make sure you understand the values on the axis. Uh, and then begin studying the graph by looking for any patterns that emerge. Do the bars of the graph grow increasingly taller? Do the lines veer sharply up or down as they extend across the graph? And that's a lot of times where you'll you know, do some critical thinking, right? If there's suddenly a drastic change. That's where you stop and look. It's like, well, what's happening here? What could be the root of this sudden change in one bar or one line as opposed to the other? <laughs> Bless you. All right, so uh, establishment, births, and deaths. 1993 to 2010, we see that now we're moving from the multi-bar graph to a multi-line graph. Uh, and the text box says, A, uh, this graph does not have a separate key. Each line is labeled so you know what it represents. So the blue line is births, right? We see that here. And then green are deaths underneath, well, mostly. And we see it, you know, change a little bit. And so the questions that ask you, the, the questions that ask you to interpret multi-bar or multi-line graphs may ask you to make inferences or draw conclusions based on the relationship of two or more data sets. And once again, you know, our values up the, the y-axis there are from 125,000 to 250,000. And we go from year, as it mentions in the title, right, 1993 to 2010. Let's see what we getting in here. All right. So it says an entrepreneur is a entrepreneur. Entrepreneur is a person who <laughs> undertakes the risk of a business venture. More commonly, we, we think of an entrepreneur as a person who owns a business when a new business begins it is said to be born when a business closes it is said to die so this is not human birth and death this is when it says establishment it is talking about businesses okay so the establishment the birth of a business is what's represented on this graph the death of that is when a business fails or closes now that graph might make a little more sense to you considering the time frame that we're talking about again. So we see, you know, uh, those two um, lines, you know, really, you know, kind of complement each other from 1993 until around 2000. And then we see a little bit of a hiccup where, uh, you know, around that time, 2001, right, we had the terrorist attacks, 9-11, uh, which would have affected growth by the end of 2001. Uh, we see some recovery where uh, you start, you know, seeing more births of businesses through the early 2000s, mid 2000s, and then lo and behold, the Great Recession. Uh, and then you see what happens there mid 2007, right? Those two lines converge, and then the death of businesses, uh, you know, rockets up, while the um, start of new businesses falls lower uh, at any time. Just about, you know, maybe that 1993 mark, but it, it you know, it declines really quickly, right? Because the economy is as bad; it's not a good time to start a business then. So let's take a look here making assumptions, which is what I just did. 
you could typically assume that an author includes information in a multi multi-bar or line graph to show a relationship, such as comparison or compare, compare and contrast or cause and effect between the data sets, right? So those two are obviously really linked. Uh, how many new businesses are started? How many businesses are failing uh, or closing? So let's take a look here. Um, Tracy, would you mind reading question one? Yes. Which of the following best describes establishment birth and death in 1990s? Uh, A, the number of births exceeded the number of deaths. B, the number of births was twice the number of deaths. C, the number of births and deaths were unchanged. See the number of births and deaths were about the same. Uh, A or B? A? Uh, A? Yeah, A, right? Yeah. All the way through the 90s of, of what we have on the graph through the 2000s until we get to that hiccup, right? 2001. The births of new businesses exceeded, and we're talking about in the hundreds of thousands, right? Of hundreds of thousands of new businesses uh, and business ventures there, uh, right? And we talk about entrepreneurs. So a lot of times that could be just, you know, a small business that could be a single person operating a business or something like that. But you had all these companies starting. And you think about that time frame too, between 1993 and that early 2000s, you had the tech startups, right? You had the dot coms and all of that. So that would be a part of that. Uh, and you also had that dot com bubble, you know, you had that burst uh, in the 2000s. So that was part of, you know, the Great Recession as well. Uh, it came a little bit before, but, uh, you know, you see that and then, oh, things kind of got better there for a while. And then boom, it got really bad there at the end. So yeah, number one is A. And two, we have our same graph. Um, Grace, would you like to read number two? Okay. During which of the following time periods was the economy probably the weakest based on the information in the graph? A, 202 to 204, B, 204 to 206, C, 206 to 208, and D, 208 to 2010. D. Yes. Yeah, if you get a question about uh, the economy, on your social studies test about, you know, when was the economy worst in the 2000s? It's going to be in that time frame there at the end of, of the first decade. So 2008 to 2010. And you can definitely, you know, infer that by the graph, right? Where the death of businesses were far exceeding the, the, the birth of new businesses. And that, you know, just thinking about that, it's like, man, that must not be a good economy. Uh, you know, nobody has faith in, in starting a new business at that time. And if there's people losing their businesses, then then that's, you know, telling you that, you know, the economy is, is weak there. Um, and then three. So here it says one important aspect of U.S. fiscal policy is the preparation and approval of an annual budget for the federal government. We've talked about this a little bit. We talked about you know sequestration and things like that. So a budget is a complex plan for collecting and spending the money required to carry out the government's operations. A budget surplus, we talked about this, occurs when the amount of money received or our revenue is greater than the amount of money spent or the expenditures. Now we saw the last time we had a surplus in the United States was the uh, that uh, 2000. Um, so when expenditures exceed revenue, the result is a budget deficit, right? So that's when we spend more than we're making. Uh, <clears throat> so here then we see U.S. government revenue and expenditures, dollars by the billion, right? So down here, that's 500 billion. And very quickly, we get to a trillion, right? Once we add that other zero. Now we're at the trillion mark. So um, 1.5 trillion, 2 trillion, up and up and up. The blue is revenue and the green is expenditures, right? So the years 2000, 2001, we ended up with a surplus, right? And more revenue than we did expenditures. 
And then 2002, that changes. And 20 years later, that's still the case. Um, so yeah, it's it, we have not been able to, actually, I'm not sure. I, I, I should say that there may have been some, a, a year or two in the Obama administration. I'm gonna look at that. We may have run a surplus or came pretty close, uh, but right, exceeding the revenue for what we have here. And then when we talked about, you know, that great recession, everything, right? We see 2009 revenue way short of what we spent, really spending in the red, right? At the end there. So, um, Etta, would you mind reading number three for us? Okay. <clears throat> it says approximately how much money did the US government receive in 2006? A, 1,750 billion, B, 2,000 billion, C, 2,250 billion, or D, 2,500 billion. Um, and I think it's D. Yeah. Look at 2006, right? How much money did the US government receive, right? So we're talking about revenue. And we look there, right there, 2006. Right, and that is, yeah, just about two point, let me go ahead and click that, 2.5, or I'm sorry, 2.5 trillion, so 2,500 billion is what that number represents. So we you know, got pretty close there with 2,500 billion dollars. The three is D as in dog. Four, um, Sasha Gay, how about you read number four? It says, which of the following likely occurred in order to produce the trend in budgetary results shown on the graph? A, the elimination of government aid programs such as welfare. B, tax increases on those making more than 250000 C, the addition of many new government programs. And D, a decrease in population in the lower tax brackets. Is it C? Yes, C or four. The addition of many new government programs, like we talked about, just like, um, you know, for one, early in the 2000s, we were, uh, you know, to Afghanistan. Then we had the Iraq War a few years later. So more defense spending. Um, and then right there at the end, uh, 2009, <clears throat> at the, uh, the Great Recession, uh, more spending for you know, more government programs to, and, and bailouts and things like that. So a lot like what we did in the Great Depression where you know, there was some you know, things done to boost the economy, um, right or wrong, you know, there's, you can look back at that, maybe some of those things were not the best idea, others were good ideas. Uh, either way, you know, to help get the economy back on track, there was some spending by the government. Uh, so that obviously indicates more government programs, right? So C, number four, and then number five. Um, let's go back to Christiana. Would you read number five for us? Number five, in which of the following years did the federal budget as, 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 habits, as habits, the largest budget deficit? That's, yeah, that's exhibit. Yeah, exhibit, exhibit the largest budget. Yeah. Okay. A, 2009, B, 2008. C, 2000, D, 2001. A? Yes, A. a. Yeah, 2009. That budget deficit, right? That's the largest one we see. The green line, way far above the blue line, that's our deficit. If it had been the other way around, that would have been a surplus. But we see that discrepancy in billions of dollars. Um, it's almost a trillion dollars, honestly. That's about two trillion. Yeah, that's about a trillion dollar deficit. 
close to 235. So that's A. Our same graph again for six. Um, Tracy, would you like to read six for us? Using the double back graph, which of the following statements can you determine the determined to be correct? A, the U.S. government achieved a surplus in three different years during the period show on the graph. B, the smallest deficit show on the graph appeared in 2005. C, government uh, revenues is set 2,000 billion for the first time in 2005. Um, D, government expenditure decreased during each year so on the paragraph. Super. D? Mm -hmm. C. Six C. C, yeah. Government um, <clears throat> revenues exceeded two billion. So we got pretty close through those years, but once we get to 2006 is when it actually uh, started to exceed it. So C, government revenues exceeded two billion or 2,000 billion for the first time in, oh, I'm sorry, 2005, yeah. It's right there. See, we, we got close. And then 2005, we, for the first time, got over that. Okay, so C for six. Um, let's see what we got here. So just as the Federal Reserve sets the discount rate at which, at which it lends money to commercial banks, these banks establish interest rates at which they lend money to their customers, right? I mentioned like the Federal Reserve is sort of the bank of banks. And that's one of the responsibilities is, is setting interest rates. And they look at the economy, um, <clears throat> you know, it's to, you know, see where to, where to set those interest rates and things. And that was part of the problem during the early 2000s that they were setting them sort of artificially low. So um, the prime rate is the lowest rate of interest that commercial banks charge, right? I mentioned that. That is the, basically the lowest rate. If you have a really good credit score, you may qualify for that prime rate. Banks will typically only offer the prime rate to their customers who have the strongest credit. The prime rate is also usually available only on specific types of credit. The interest rates of other types of loans are often expressed as a certain percentage over time. The graph shows the prime rate used by banks during two different 10 year periods, right? So the Federal Reserve sets those rates and then the banks decide, okay, if this is the rate, then what can we, you know, what interest rate do we charge our customers? And <clears throat> so first we look at the key, right? So the blue line is 1990 to 1999. And then the green line is 2000 to 2009. So our percent, right? Our y-axis shows the percentage, the interest rates there, the percentage. And then across the bottom, we have the 10-year period. So the blue line represents that 10-year period between 1990 and 1999. The green is the 10-year period uh, between 2000 and 2009. And we see they stayed pretty close there, right? Sort of similar. And then 2007-ish, you know, we see them kind of change. And then we know, again, those interest rates dropped because uh, basically, you know, the economy was struggling. So the Federal Reserve set the interest rate low. And of course, those subprime loans were uh, defaulted on. So that only left basically people with really good credit that was able to afford, uh, or not afford, but they were the only ones qualifying in that time frame, right? They're the only ones that really had, um, were getting offered loans in those years. So thinking with that in mind, um, Grace, would you mind reading number seven? <clears throat>
Grace, did you read seven? All right, how about Etta? You take seven for us. Okay. At the beginning of which of the following years did the prime rate reach its lowest point between 1990 and 1999? A, year three, 1992. B, year four, 1993. C, year five, 1994. Or D, year six, 1995. Um, let's see, the lowest, it looks like it would be year five, so C. So, B, year mm -hmm. four, yeah. So, look here. Oh, that's before that one, yeah. please. <laughs> 90, 99, right? So, yeah, it, it's confusing because the, the year, right, uh, on the graph is not necessarily matching with the, the, the year itself. So yeah, that's gonna be year four, B as in boy for number seven. And eight, um, Sasha Gay, would you mind reading eight for us? Which of the following statements can you determine to be correct based on the double line graph? A, the prime rate decreased dramatically between 2000 and 2003. B, the prime rate in 2007 was lower than the prime rate in 1994. C, the prime rate increased in three consecutive years from 1996 to 1998. And D, the highest prime rate recorded between 2000 and 2009 occurred in 2006. Um, is it A? Yeah, A, right. So 2000, 2003, um, it, it dipped dramatically there. Okay. So A, looking at the beginning of that graph, right? So boom, from 9%, <laughs> and then it fell all the way down to 4% there. Okay, so A for eight, nine, same graph, um, back to Christiana. You read number nine for us. Number nine. The end of which of the following years would you preferred borrower have received the best prime prime rate? A 1990. B, 1996, C, 2000, D, 2003. Is it A? It's D. So even though they kind of correspond with each other, right? They sort of parallel. But once we get to the end there, 2003, we see that it's at its lowest all time for those two, right? For those two decades, basically, from 1990 to 2009. So that green bar there right at about 3%, right, is that prime rate. So uh, if you were, you know, looking for a home um, uh, around, uh, you know, this time between 2000 to 2003, so right in there, as far as what your answer choices are, right, early on. So right there, as far as the, the answer choices we have, if you're a home buyer, that would be a good time to have gotten a mortgage. So D for number nine, D is in dog. Okay, and then 10, we're sticking with the same graph here. Um, Tracy, I'll get you to read number 10. Tracy? Yes. Okay. Which of, yeah. Which of the following chain no realization can you make based on the information content in this double line graph? A, the prime rate 
generally decreased throughout each 10 years period. B, B the price rate generally, generally changed by about one percentage point each year. C, the change in prime rate general followed a bell shaped curve in each decade. D, the price rate generally remained higher in the 1990s than in the 2000s. Um, um, the region, region, I see the, the, the rap. Sure. Uh, um, go I see the answer again. Uh, C? It's D. The prime D. rate generally remained higher in the 90s than in the 2000s, right? So that blue line constantly stayed above which represented the 90s, constantly stayed above the green line. So they're always a little bit higher throughout that time. So D as in dog for 10. And some new information. So it says one important way to evaluate whether the government's monetary policy is benefiting the nation's economy is to examine the gross domestic product or GDP. As you've already learned, GDP is the total value of goods and services produced in a nation during a specified time period. Many nations regard this value as the best indicator of a nation's economic activities. The multi-bar graph shows how the various components of the GDP changed in the United States between 2000 and 2010, so just over two-year time. And you know, the, like it mentions here, when we talk about GDP, the United States has the highest GDP in the world, uh, and China right now is a very, very close second. Uh, and that, you know, has just always been sort of one of those things that, you know, consider the su success of a nation, you know, where is your GDP? Um, that's kind of how, we, you know, you might hear about the G20, like the top economic countries in the world. Uh, that's because they have a high GDP, you know, uh, Brazil and uh, Great Britain and all these places, you know, and they have like these conferences and stuff. Um, so here, U.S. gross domestic product by component, right? So thinking about some of those individual pieces that make up the gross domestic product. So the blue is personal consumption expenditures. Uh, green is gross private domestic investment. Uh, the black is net export of goods and services. And then that beige yellowy color is government consumption expenditures and gross investment. So look at that, right? And that's in billions of dollars again. So, uh, you know, 2,000 billion, basically 2 trillion, you know, 4 trillion, 6 trillion, 8, up to 10. That's personal consumption expenditures. So for the individual like us, green is the gross private domestic investment. And then black, we see net export of goods and services. So when it says net export, <clears throat> it means we've, uh, we didn't export as much as we imported, right? That was a, a negative value there because it dropped below zero. And then blue, again, right? So personal consumption always at the highest. Green, always kind of stealth heady. So, yeah held steady and government consumption and expenditures also held steady, All right? So pretty steady, right, for those three years. Let's see what we get into here. So um, how about we try Grace again here, with number 11. Okay. Number 11, which of the following was the appropriate value of the gross private domestic investments in 2010? A, $1,500 billion. B, $1,750 billion. 
C, $2,000 billion, and D, $2,500 billion. B. Yes, yeah, B is in boy, right? So 2010 is the year we're looking at, gross private domestic investment. So that's green, right? 2010, uh, they got a little nitpicky here, right? Because that almost looks like 2000 billion. Uh, but B, right, is 1750 because it does not quite make it. So B as in boy for 11. Okay, and continuing with GDP, let's go with ETA. Did you read number 12? Okay. Which of the... Um, which of the following is most likely to account for the negative values shown on the graph? A, large increases in government spending on community programs. B, the growth of high technology industries in the United States. C, a negative balance of trade between the United States and other nations. Or D, a seasonal increase in domestic consumer spending. Um, well, it looks like it will be the black one down there, the negative value. Yep. And I will be net expert in goods and services. So thinking about, you know, that one negative value, right, in the black, and what we just mentioned here, right, so net export of goods and services, right? Mm -hmm. What would that mean? Then why would that be negative? Um, B maybe. So it's C, right? Mm -hmm. So that's talking about our, our trade, right? So what we've imported and exported. So if there's a net, right, net export, this would mean everything that we exported. And okay. right, so if that's negative, that means, well, we must have you know, we sold less to other countries than we bought from them. So that means there was a negative balance of trade, right? We wound up bringing more in than we, we traded out. Mm. 12 is C is in cat. And 13, um, Sasha Gay, how about finishing out with 13 here? It says, based on the information in the graph, which of the following statements is false? A, the value of personal consumption expenditures decreased each year sh shown on the graph. B, in, tw in 2012, the value of gross private domestic investment was less than that of government consumption expenditures and gross investment. C, the net export of goods and services had a less negative effect on GDP in 2010 than in 2011. And D, the value of government consumption expenditures and gross investment stayed about the same each year. Is it A? Yeah, it is A. 13 is A, right? We can go through there, you know, make sure you read the question closely. It's asking for a false statement, right? Which one of these is false? So the value of personal consumption expenditures decreased. No, right? We see that pretty easily looking at that blue line. Boop, boop, boop. It certainly went up just a little bit, at least each year. It definitely did not decline. So A for 13. So let's see, do I need to follow up here with any answers for you guys? Everybody good on the workbook? Seven, seven to nine. Seven through nine. Okay, seven is B as in boy. Okay. Eight is A. Okay. Nine, D as in dog. All right, thank you. No problem. Okay, and ta-da, that was the last lesson. Last lesson in social studies for you guys. Um, Stop recording here. And um, 